So let's begin the seminar. I'm very happy to have Kumron Wafa from Harvard University. He'll be telling us about the new Stromland conjecture. We'll also have Kumron here on uh, Monday to give the physics uh, colloquium. Um, I think for the title in French, I was thinking about La Nouvelle Conjecture du Marais, but uh, I don't know if it's a good one or not. Anyway, so Kumron, thanks for coming here. We're very happy to have you. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation to give a talk here. Uh, I think it's my first talk here. Uh, so it's my first visit here, so I'm very thankful for the invitation. Um, so I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, well, perhaps it would have been more natural for my Monday and Friday talk to have been switched because that would be a general introduction. Some of you may not familiar with, be familiar with this topic, and so that perhaps would have been a good, good starting point. But so here I'm assuming you already know the subject. I'm just going to say what is the latest some of my colleagues and I have been working on. So that's the slight apology in terms of the order of things, but what can I do? So. Uh, Oh boy, you have to be athletic. So, uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, some new swampland conjectures. And uh, basically, uh, three or four topics, depending on how much time I have. So, the first the topic. topic so, so, the Sackler rule is that in principle seminars are supposed to be one hour, but the, it's like a black hole horizon, it can be RH plus or minus RH. So, if it's one hour and a half and there are questions, we don't mind. People no problem. And yes, so on. I don't so have. Feel free to make more introductory and go longer. Sure. We okay. Don't mind. It's okay, so I'll, I'll go easy. So, the first thing is the relation between ADS and the swamp plant. This is based on a work I, uh, I did with collaborators, uh, Dieter Luz and uh, Deran Palfi. The second one is going to be uh, the Transplankian Censorship Conjecture. This is the work I did with my student Pedroia. The third topic is Cobordism and the Swampland. And uh, this is the work with my student, McNamara. And the fourth one, I'm actually going to only probably mention the results, not so much the description of the uh, derivations or anything. And uh, this is the works uh, I've done uh, recently with uh, two different collaborations. One of them, well, the total number of people involved with Hichio Kim, uh, Gary Shu, and uh, my student, uh, Huri Tarazi. Uh, so these basically are getting uh, restrictions on, on uh, number of massless modes in su supersymmetric gravity, in supergravity theories. So upper bounds on the number of massless modes. So this one I mainly, We'll just mention the results, some of the results, without going into too much detail. This is going to be a topic I will talk about uh, on Monday morning in, at IHES in the conference in honor of Shadashvili. So this is going to be, I'm going to talk about the details there, but I'm going to just mention here. So my main focus is going to be the first two topics here. So, um, so the first topic. So first of all, the motivation for the first topic. Um, one of, the, one of the principles that we believe, at least in the context of Minkowski space compactification of string theory, in the context of Swampland, is that the number of possible quantum gravities consistent are finite. Okay, so <coughs> where is that motivation coming from? The motivation is coming from the fact that if you study supersymmetric examples, they correspond to compactifications of things like Calabia. And there is no proof, but it's believed that there are only a finite number of Calabias. Well, Yao conjectured this 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, that they are finite, even though there's no proof as of now. For dimension one, it's true, elliptic curve. Dimension two, K3 or T4, that's again true. Dimension three, Calabia threefold, we already don't know, but it seems to be a bound. For the elliptic Calabia threefolds, the one which have elliptic vibration is proven to be finite, again. So, so that it's building up to the point that we believe it's a true statement, but we don't have a, neither a physical argument nor a mathematical proof, but strong belief or strong suspicion is true. However, 
So if you, if you take this finiteness and then you contrast it to the ADS, you find the contradiction. Namely, there are infinitely many ADS examples in, in string theory. So what happened? If you take an ADS in some dimensions, you get infinitely many examples. You don't get any bound on anything. You get infinitely many possibilities. So what is, what, how does this fit with the general planar principle in the context of some number where we expect only a finite number of them? Let me, first of all, rephrase the statement of finiteness. We believe that if you fix the gravity in any dimension to be uh, dynamical, we expect there to be a finite number of possibilities with gravity being dynamical in that dimension. For example, in type 2b, with 2 comma 0 supersymmetry in 10d, it's unique. We believe it's just type 2b in 10d. That does not mean that you cannot have infinitely many possible defects in that theory with infinitely many modes on it. For example, you can put ND3 brains and study ND3 brains in 10 dimensions. There's no problem. You can have arbitrary n in it. So you have arbitrary number of masses modes and there are infinitely many possibilities. So this is not a statement that there are no infinite number of defects or elements in that sectors of that theory. That's possible. But notice that gravity is not dynamical on the level of the D3 brain, for example. They're not 4D gravity. We're talking about 10D gravity. So the defects, there could be infinitely many defects in the lower dimensional subspace, but not, not filling the whole space. You cannot have infinitely many D9 brains, for example. That's not possible. So the statement about the finiteness has to do with the cases where the gravity is dynamical in that dimension. That's, that's a key point. You can nevertheless have arbitrary number of defects in a theory of gravity. That's not bounded. That's not restricted in a quantum gravity context. So let's ta take that into account. The, then the philosophy applied to ADS is basically the following, that when we talk about the ADS holography, for example, we said ADS holography maps ADS to some CFD dual. The, the first statement is that this is a misnomer. That's not a correct description of holography. It should be ADS times something, times some manifold. And it's crucial to take into account this manifold, as I'll try to argue. This could be dual to a CFD. So why, why am I emphasizing this? The statement is going to be the following, that if you take the limit of the ADS with arbitrarily small cosmological constant, as the cosmological constant goes to zero for the ADS, the claim is that you get infinitely many light modes. If you didn't have this M, if you could just dial ADS to a given flat thing, you would imagine that you just have just Einstein's theory as the low energy degrees of freedom and not infinitely many light modes. So the statement is that the near, nearly flat limit of ADS doesn't exist really by itself, that you should get a tower of states. And the tower of states means that the scale of ADS cannot be decoupled from the size of the internal geometry. That is the case in all the examples we know at least the, all the ones which we trust up to now, that there is an internal manifold for which whose scale is correlated with the ADS scale. They are not decoupled. And this is basically the idea that this sep the scales cannot be separated between the ADS scale and the internal space. So therefore, to say that, that we have a gravity in ADS is not correct. We have a gravity in ADS times m. In other words, you cannot dial ADS to be arbitrarily large. So usually, I think when people talk about ADS, they talk too loosely in this context. They just say we have ADS gravity. That's not true. It's always there's ADS times something, and that something is as big as the ADS scale. If you cannot make that fix with that being big. So that I will claim, I will explain why this resolves the contradiction I mentioned a, a minute ago. First of all, why is that the case? First of all, is that related? The claim is that. Uh, more than that, more specifically, that if you consider this situation, there are infinitely many light modes with a tower of mass, which in Planck units is proportional to some power of the cosmological constant as the cosmological constant goes to zero, where A is some order one number. So therefore, in particular, as lambda goes to zero, you should get an infinitely, light, infinitely many light states. There's a stronger version of this conjecture, which, uh, which one can make, is that A is exactly equal to 1 half when you're talking about supersymmetric case, at least. 
So all the examples in string theory where we know of, where we can actually do uh, explicit constructions, do have a equals to one half strictly in this limit. So that's supported with all the examples we know. The holographic dual of this state, the CFT dual of this statement, translates to the statement that the dimension of the operators of the dual CFT is of order one, and there is no arbitrarily big gap in the dual CFT. So the dimension of the operators of the dual CFT being order one without an arbitrarily big gap translates to the statement that, in this case, uh, A equals to a half, basically. OK. So what's the argument for this? Well, the, well the ar one argument is just observation, really. Just this is what seems to happen in the context that we are familiar with. But actually, there's an another version of the argument which is related to the distance conjecture. So I have to remind you what distance conjecture says. Uh, this is, this is conjecture is basically um, characterizing dualities that we have observed in quantum gravity in the language of a principle of quantum gravity, which is of this form. If you take, suppose you have a scalar field in, uh, in the theory of quantum gravity. The claim is that the theory, uh, if you consider the different expectation value of these fields, if you make them to be large, your effective field theory description breaks down. So in other words, if you have a theory involving the gravity and some scalar field and some other things, as phi goes to infinity, the description breaks down. And a new description takes over, which is dual to this. And the reason the description breaks down, or how it's manifested here, is that you get a tower of light states whose mass goes like e to the minus alpha phi for some alpha order one in Planck units. Where this corresponds to the light modes of the dual description. So there's, a, in other words, this, this is basically enshrining the duality principle in string theory. That whenever you go to extremes in the parameter space, in this case, expectation value of some scalar field, you will get a dual description, which is made of new light modes, which was not part of the original theory, which were very massive here, so we did not include it in the effective Lagrangian to begin with. But we cannot, do, we cannot ignore them if you go larger and larger than phi. They'll become light, and if whatever cutoff you have, if you have started with a given cutoff to the right of the Lagrangian, they will always cross the cutoff at some value of phi, and therefore you cannot ignore them. So that's the basic, basic idea. How does this relate to this thing I'm talking about here? Well, the idea is that this does not just have to apply to, to scalar fields. It could apply to any field in your theory. In fact, the scalar fields that I'm talking about here are the metric degree of freedom, typically, in the internal geometry. Therefore, if we talk about the scalar field web, it's equivalent to talking about the metric web. So if you rescale the metric, the same thing should apply to any field, including the G, and whether the G is internal or external should not matter. There's a diffeomorphism symmetry. You can think about internal or external. But changing the cosmological constant is related to the changing the metric in the G space. In other words, you can now imagine taking the G and rescaling it by a factor, let's say, e to the phi G. So if you want to go to the limit of big ADS or nearly flat ADS, you just rescale. You have to find the rescaled metric of phi, which does that. Of course. Typically, what solutions we have in the context of holography is that we have a discrete family, but we can always choose discrete set of phi's that take it to whatever you, they are. And in which case, there's a distance conjecture applies to this case. So here you find that the cosmological constant will go like e to the minus 2 phi, let's say. And so therefore, the mass going, or e to the minus phi, if you're rescaling the metric like that, and so therefore, since this conjecture says that there should be light states of the form e to the minus alpha phi, this just means that some power of lambda should go like the mass scale. So there would be just, so in other words, this idea that the masses go to some power of lambda naturally fits with the distance conjecture. So it's a very nice connection and it's supported with all the examples we know in string theory. This is a very strong statement. It just means, for example, ADS3, pure ADS3 gravity, for example, should not exist. That is, if you take the ADS3 gravity, if you make it lighter and lighter, you should get a tower of light state. You cannot avoid talking, we cannot just talk about the pure Einstein theory with just the cosmological constant, negative cosmological constant. That should not exist. 
at least not if the cosmological constants are very small, so because that's the limit we are talking about. There should be, there could be something Planckian, like cosmological constant of order one in Planck units, that, that we cannot rule out, but that's not a physical, classically observable ADS. You want big ADS to talk about. So for large enough ADS, it should not be possible, and therefore we should get this tower of states. Here in the normal theory. Exactly, exactly. So in the usual string theory, it's a well-known fact, for example, and this is what I want to mention now. For example, ADS 5 times S5, the basic example, as S5 is getting bigger and bigger, you can get this tower of states. That's what it is. You cannot separate the size of a S5 from ADS. But that's crucial, because <laughs> when you put two objects in ADS, you think the gravitational force goes like 1 over R to some power of, related to the dimension of ADS, but that's not true. Because this other space, the graviton goes also in the bulk. And you cannot make the gravity not to go in the bulk if its gravity in the bulk is sufficiently, if the size of the internal space is the same size. So therefore, to talk about lower dimensional gravity is wrong. We are really always talking about that extra space as part of We should be talking about the full space. So, um, so just to explain uh, the, the question that Iosef asked is that, consider one of the basic examples, ADS 3 times S3 times, let's say, K3. It's an example for holography in this context, well studied. So if you make ADS big, S3 has to become big. Of course, K3 doesn't have to become big. So you can have a situation where you have a largest S3, and then you get this tower of light state coming from this S part, for example. So it doesn't mean that every part of geometry should become big. But that means that the extreme limit of this basically is becoming like R6. If you get the extreme limit of this, and therefore, there's a unique K3. So therefore, no matter what you're doing here, it just tells you, oh, there's just one K3 that we're talking about. So that infinitely many possibilities we're talking about is not there. It's just really just the one, one, one possibility, which you can view these as analog of uh, objects within that space. So therefore, there's still just one example here, K3, or T4, two examples, whatnot. So there are not infinitely many families. Let me explain it again with one more example, which I think to illustrate the point more clearly. So, so for example, um, we say that in the context of uh, super gra in the context of uh, gravity theory, we only have a finite number of masses modes. Well, of course, we, we expect finite number of masses most, but uniformly finite, meaning that if you fix your dimension of space-time, if you fix the number of supersymmetries, we expect that the number of masses most should be, strictly speaking, something which is a function only of d and n. So there's an upper bound which depends only on the dimension of the total number of supersymmetries. We don't have a proof of this, but believe, we believe it's like this based on the example, like a Calabia I told you about. But if you ignored this, you can find a counterexample in the context of ADS. So let me give you a counterexample. There are conformal theories with arbitrary large global symmetry, SUN, global symmetries, and you can take N to be as large as you want. Gates, global symmetries in the CFD and the dual holographic picture becomes a gauge symmetry. So you're going to get a pretty large number of gauge group in the ADS context, which means you can have a pretty large number of masses small. So this violates the statement. So what are we talking about? Okay, is the, is, the, is the question clear? So I will explain why this is not a contradiction with the picture I'm describing here. So let me give you an example of how this happens. And a simple example is uh, you start with ADS7 times S4, so which is holographically dual to the theory involving NM5, uh, so let's say, NM5 brain, where it, N depends on the, uh, determines the fluxes and all that for the ADS7, the well-known example. Now you can mod this theory out by, well, you can do the following. You can take NM5 brain probing AK minus one singularity in the transverse way. So in other words, you can have AK minus one singularity and you probe an M5 brain. This gives you a theory which again is conformal. Now this time it has, conformal, it has 60 conformal symmetry with 1,0 supersymmetry. If you did this. And then you can ask what is, and this theory by the way has SUK times SUK global symmetry.
And you could ask, how is this reflected on the dual CFT? And it's very simple. It turns out that this corresponds to modding this group out by uh, modding this space out, ADS7 times S4, by a ZK rotation, where the ZK rotates the sphere with the north and the south pole fixed. And therefore, it gives you two fixed points which have AK minus one singularity. But AK minus one singularities of the north and the south, in the M-theory context, correspond to gate symmetries, as we well know. So therefore, this gives you SUK times SUK gate symmetries. On ADS7, as was expected, because we have SUK times SUK global symmetry, therefore the bulk has ADS SUK times SUK gate symmetry, consistent. So then you would say, OK, this is inconsistent with this statement. However, this gate symmetry does not live on the full space. It lives on the subspace. Co-dimension 4 subspace, which corresponds to the north or south pole on the sphere, times ADS7. So this is exactly like the defects in a non-compact space. But there should be no restriction, and there is no restriction. However, if you looked at the full thing as one object, Indeed, this is not masses mode propagating the full space. So the gravity is dynamical in 11 dimension, and the gauge theory lives on a subspace. That's what it is. There's no contradiction. So this actually unifies with the principle here, which gives you further evidence that the pure ADS should not exist. So pure ADS existing would have been in contradiction with this simple picture that the number of masses mode should be finite. That's, and that's, that's, so that jives very well with it. So therefore, we are predicting that pure ADS belongs to the swamp land in the fl nearly flat limit. Any questions? So this was the basic, the first topic I wanted to cover. Any questions about that? OK, so let me move on. Oh, well, I will make a parenthetical comment here before moving on. Here I was just talking about the ADS. You might ask, what about the de Sitter? Well, if there were de Sitter spaces with some cosmological constant lambda, you would imagine the same argument that I just told you would tell you that there's a tower of state whose mass goes like lambda to the A. Same argument. Because you can rescale the metric and you get a tower of light states. But this only applies for the extreme limit as lambda goes to zero. Like our universe. So if, if, indeed, if indeed our universe is described by the sitter space, lambda is very small, 10 to the minus 100 to whatever the number is. It's very tiny. Therefore, we imagine it's small. And therefore, there should be a tower of light state in our universe, if we live in the sitter space, whose mass is related to the cosmological constant to a power of order 1. Do we know any such things? Well. Not too far from the kind of objects we know. For example, the mass of neutrinos lambda to the quarter. So this, this suggests that perhaps there is, if indeed, for example, the dark sector could easily accommodate a tower of light states whose scale is related to lambda to some power of order one. For example, things like steroid neutrinos or things like that, where you have powers of this kind could very well be related to a possibility if we indeed had this other space, but we don't know. But at any rate, it is interesting to say that this relates the kind of things that we would like to do in the context of uh, issues that are very difficult to see from the viewpoint of effective field theory. Why does the dark energy have anything to do with the mass of elementary particles, for example? This is telling you that there is a natural connection between them, unavoidable from the context of quantum gravity, where you would expect that if the lambda is small, then there should be a tower of light state. It doesn't say why lambda should be small, but it says, aha, uh -huh, if you give me a small lambda, then you should have a light, light tower of state. And that is the connection. Question, the thing about ADS, so if you, if you do, for example, ADS four times some Calabria or six, and you, know, you, 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 you do KKLT, for example, you can get a small Calabria O, and you, know, you put some effects by hand, and then you, know, you can get a small Calabria O, and a big ADS four. That somehow seems to go so, the question, so that will tell you that in the concept of KKLT, you cannot get an arbitrarily 
large throat in that case. That's related to that statement. But if you had if, if ADS without putting any no, I'm talking about ADS. I'm saying that if you could construct an ADS, if you could, could construct an ADS with an arbitrarily small clavia yes. compared to the arbitrarily big ADS, it yes. would have been a contradiction with this conjecture. So therefore, in other words, the statement is saying you cannot construct examples which is like that, which would mean that the dual theory would have an infinite big gap. It would come from <coughs> So in other words, this is related to the uh, separation of scale issue. But this could be super symmetric. I mean, I'm not about super symmetric. I am talking. I'm forget about the anti-distribution and all that stuff. Yeah, this would. I am talking about the n equals to one super conformal field theories mm -hmm. in three dimensions. So, so even there we are saying. Even there we are saying that there should be a problem with those constructions. If you, if the claim was that you can find a situation where the power, where the Calabria scale is separated from ADS, that should not exist. So before even we get to optics thing. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yes. The example is in the freedom. So this is one state. Where is the rest of the tower? So I'm, this is certainly not the, the full tower. I'm just saying that I'm just saying that in the context of the neutrinos, we know this is true. So there's a relation between M and lambda. Now, people have talked about steroid neutrinos, steroid neutrinos, which means that they have the same kind of scale. So they could be part of the dark sector. For example, I'm not saying we have discovered them, but I'm saying they could easily. I could easily imagine. Scenarios where we have towers related to this lambda to one quarter scale as part of the dark sector, for instance. There'll be no problem. So more than that, I'm saying that if we are having this disturbed space, we are predicting something order one having such a tower, which presumably is in the dark sector. Otherwise, we would have known about it, presumably. So that's what I'm trying to say. It would be very interesting to try to think about this if there is indeed this inter space. Yes? The tower you're mentioning into the space in time step. And not necessarily. It's like it doesn't have to be like in string theory. So I was worried you No, when I say tower, when I say tower, I have to be clear clear about it. I mean the mass scale in the tower. For example, in string theory, mass squared goes like n, right? So it's not linear in n, but n goes like root n, for example, and so on. But there is but there is a string scale, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, but I count neutrinos, wouldn't I therefore predict that there's a huge number of Towers of neutrinos, which are more than swap the cosmological constant. Because if I took the whole the tower. Well, the question of how they fit in the cosmology and all that is a separate question, which we might have to, of course, evaluate. What does it do? Does it, for example, the number of, uh, for example, dynamical uh, neutrinos at the early universe, the ones which couple to the, the, to the cosmological soup, should be that bounded as near three? You know, that there's a bound on that. So there, there are these kind of bounds that we have to worry about. Whether or not it's uh, in equilibrium in the gas or, or, or with the, the background or not, these are part of the issues that people have. But people have, uh, people have talked about possibilities of having other states, not necessarily towers, but they have talked about such states. How many of them you have and so on is, is, is a different statement. It'd be very interesting to try to, I think, come up with cosmological scenarios where it would give you some kind of restrictions or some kind of predictions about what imprint these kind of towers might have. This is, I think, what I'm trying to say is that this picture is very naturally motivated from the distance conjecture. There should be a tower of this state. Now, if, if there is a visitor. Of course, if it's not the city, as I'm now next going to talk about, this. Okay, uh, good. Okay, so I move on to my next one. So the next one is the Transplankian. Censorship conjecture. Censorship. And this statement, even though, well, okay, I have to give you a motivation for the statement before I actually say the statement. The motivation for the statement is follows. So when you look at a, a theory of quantum gravity with a bunch of scalars, um, we, we have examples of this type in string theory. The easiest ones are when the potential for these scalars is zero. <coughs> and th in these cases, the only examples we know of this type of string theory is when the theory is su has some supersymmetry. So these are well studied. And in these cases, the geometry of scalar fields is a very non-trivial, typically a manifold. So the geometry, there could be many of these files, form some manifold with some metric on them, where the metric is dictated by the kinetic term of these scalar fields. So, so, so there is a metric on the space of these scalar fields, which gives you a non-trivial geometry. And people have studied the structure of this, of this space. So what one finds is that typically of order uh, one in Planck units, there's an interior region of this space, 
but you can also go far away into an infinite distance away into various different kind of corners or limits that you can take, different separate limits you can take. And for example, the distance conjecture that I was mentioning is saying that if you go too far away in any of these directions, you'll get a tower of states which, whose mass scale go like e to the minus alpha phi as phi in the distance space is going to infinity. So, um, so this is the general picture we, we have seen in the examples, and this is part of the motivations for the distance conjecture. Now, in the context of uh, cosmology, whether you're interested in inflation or late universe and so on, you're interested in the case where V is not zero. And so you're asking, can I have V not being equal to zero? Well, what we have seen is that it's not easy to arrange V being not zero and having a stable situation. For example, when you go far away in these directions, these are what's called the weak coupling regions. Of, of the description. And in fact, there, are, there could be many weakly coupled descriptions which are not this for the same theory. In other words, uh, which is not the same uh, low energy description or weak coupling description. So you have inequivalent weak coupling descriptions, which is the bread and butter of dualities in quantum gravity. So we are saying one particular theory could have many dual descriptions weakly coupled in their own right, which are not weakly coupled. So this guy is not weakly coupled relative to this guy, but has only weak coupling and so on. Okay, so people have no go theorems in the regime of weak couplings when you go extreme weak directions that this cannot be, that you cannot get just V's constant. In fact, people have found that you always will have a situation where V prime is bigger than or equal to some constant times V for phi much, much bigger than one. In other words, as you go to weak coupling regimes, arbitrarily large, you find that there are, that you can, you always get the non-trivial gradient. And in particular, you cannot have, uh, for example, you cannot have these constant and positive, or these constant and negative. In other words, we, we have also seen that V cannot be has to go to zero regardless of whether it's positive or negative at infinite distance. So in other words, there's a belief that the potential goes always to zero at infinite distance in phi space with a power, with a, with a slope direction, which is itself bounded by some constant times v. Huge number of examples, and there are a huge number of no-go theories. So I think this is uncontroversial, kind of. We all believe that, regardless of construction. What goes on here, we don't have a good handle, because it's not weakly coupled. And what goes on near here, borderline between interior and extreme regions, again, it's hard to debate what means being a three coupling and not. And that's part of the issue of difficulty in establishing whether we find trustable solutions or not. Namely, to what extent can we have a control over this region? But I think it's no, 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 uh, it is not controversial that if you go far enough in any of these directions, this is satisfied. So nobody seems to debate this issue, so it's kind of uncontroversial. Did, did you say that V goes to zero as well? Sorry? Did you say V goes Yes, yes. V goes to zero in all the string theory contexts. There's no example where V doesn't go to zero. What about gauge supergravity where V goes to zero? You can, so, super, so string theory I'm talking about, the ones which are actually realized in string theory. So whether or not they're consistent, gravity is different. There's no, there's no problem writing a supergravity. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the issue about the swamp, that this gravity is, being able to write the supergravity is far from saying it exists as a consistent theory. That's the that's main point here. So in other words, Exactly as you say, it's surprising from supergravity this statement. Why should it be like this? There's no reason in here. Just like the power conjecture, there's no reason that there should be a tower of states going like the minus alpha phi. From supergravity, you don't, you're perfectly fine without such a tower either. Uh, supergravity gives you exponential growth in the so I'm very happy with the, with the statement about the power. Sorry, this is the, these are the KK towers, for example. The supergravity doesn't see these. So supergravity is surprised even with the distance conjecture. So supergravity is already is, is blind to this question. So for supergravity, you can have very different situations than this. So this is not a property of supergravity. It's a property of consistent supergravity, we believe. So in fact, people have found in concrete examples, very slow both here, for example, uh, uh, 
the best bound people found in fourth dimension involves v prime is bigger than or equal to square root of two over three <coughs> times v for large enough distances. So there, there are, uh, there are bounds where very, very sharp particular numbers here up here. Okay, so motivated by this observation, at, which is uncontroversial at large distance, uh, with a group of people, we conjecture that maybe this whole property applies inside as well. Okay, of course we don't have access really to the inside region, so we are on a limb making this conjecture. It could be true, it could be false. Far enough, we have a lot of evidence. Inside, we don't have as much evidence what's going on. But this, regardless of whether one believes it as a conjecture inside or not, it is fair to say that even if it's true, you have to have a principle of quantum gravity which tells you this as a consequence, not as a, this by itself doesn't sound like a principle. It should be a consequence of something else. So, so we are searching for what kind of principle can give you such a relation. Of course, if this is true everywhere, including the inside, it forbids the sitter space altogether, because then V is positive at a critical point, if you have like a potential like this, then V prime being zero is inconsistent with V being positive, and therefore it rules out the sitter space. So it's crucial to establish whether this condition is correct or not, and what kind of consequences it has. So anyhow, the motivation is, even if this kind of statement is true, what is the underlying quantum gravity reason for it? That's the question that would, would be the natural uh, missing ingredient, even if it's true. In the, quantum in the quantum field theories, we are typically familiar with, uh, with having cutoffs in, your theory, in our theory. For example, in the, so typically we have some kind of a UV cutoff, some, some uh, ultraviolet scale, and we talk about correlation outside, and somehow the effective theory outside is insensitive to the detail of what's going on in the UV and so forth, and we talk about the effective description away from some cutoff region and we are perfectly fine with this description of field theories. In the context of quantum gravity, we also expect there to be a natural cutoff. In that case, there's a Planck scale. So we expect the objects we talk about make sense of the classical objects or things we can talk about in a, in a meaningful way. In this sense, it's bigger than Planck units. We expect some quantum uh, fluctuations of gravity to be so strong in the Planck scale that we do not think about space in the usual way in scales less than Planck. Okay. In quantum field theories, we only typically have, typically we have the UV cutoff, but not necessarily an IR cutoff. But in the context of gravity, especially when you have constant expansion of the universe, like in inflation or if you have the center space, you also have an infrared cutoff. An infrared cutoff is the horizon of the universe, where the A squared would be, for example, related to the to the center, uh, for, for the, the, the energy in the universe. <coughs> So there's two kinds of scales, uh, the, low, the small scale and the large scale cutoff. Now, if you consider the, the story about quantum fluctuations generated through the inflation process in particular, what happens is that the modes, you study the fluctuation, fluctuating quantum modes, and when they cross the infrared scale, they classicalize, they, they, they freeze, and these give rise to the fluctuations that we observe today in the context of inflation, which are scale invariant fluctuations that uh, presumably is observed in CMB. But there's something bizarre about that, that having, for big modes there's no problem, but for small modes, if you have modes smaller than Planck scale, getting and classicalized and freezing when they cross the horizon <coughs> looks a little strange, because then that means you have a classical picture, so to speak, of subplanetary region. So people already discussed this issue in the context of inflation more than around 15, 20 years ago, and people debated whether this is really a problem or not in computing fluctuation for inflation or not, and there are various debates over whether it's true or not. I'm not going to get to that. I'm just going to ask, what if this doesn't happen? That is, what, is, what if the modes which are smaller than the planet never are allowed to cross the horizon? Okay, let me just ask this question. Is that an interesting restriction or not? What kind of restriction does it correspond to? So in other words, if, we, if, you, if a mole starts here, it has never a chance to cross this. 
well, if it expands enough and long enough, it will cross that support. So I'm saying that should not happen. That should not be allowed. Which means that if you take over time, the final radius, if you take like a kind of FRW type cosmology, the final radius, or the initial one, which is the expansion factor, times the Planck, should always be less than the size of the final universe, which is 1 over H final. So I'm just saying, what, what, what condition does this imply? Let me assume that this is always the case. So well, this will give you the following restriction. So if I have V of 5, I can evolve it and see whether or not what happens to A final over A initial and to make sure this doesn't happen. How do I evolve it? Well, I take uh, the usual uh, Einstein gravity in the form applied to this. You have the usual uh, couplings. You look at the equation for the evolving of the scalar field with V as a function of phi, which have, including the Hubble friction term, for A squared is related to V plus phi dot squared. So you can talk about evolving of the scalar field over a potential. And from this, you can compute A as a function of T and then compute this and make, ask whether this happens or not. So suppose I exclude this happening it will give you a restriction on what Vs are allowed. What kind of potentials will exclude this? You find that for large P, you find that V prime <coughs> should be bigger than square root of 2 thirds P. It just follows from this condition. So the bounds that people have found within string theory, the kind of lower terms, is already a consequence of this simple statement. So that's quite, quite surprising that there's a simple idea that you cannot make the, the sub planking modes cross the horizon already captures the condition that the potentials always have this uh, follow at, at, at infinity. One thing I forgot to say is that this actually is very much in line with the distance conjecture in the following way. Because if you assume that there's a power of state of the form 2 minus alpha phi, if you believe this, then that means in particular there's a natural scale for the cosmological constant, which is mass to the power of the dimension of the space time. Just compute it unless, unless there's cancellation like supersymmetry and all that. You would expect a typical one would go like m to the d, which means that this should go like e to the minus alpha d phi. So in particular, you learn that uh, v prime and v are related, just like the slope of this guy <coughs> will give you the constant. So in other words, this statement already is very much in the spirit of the, of the distance conjecture. <coughs> and here now we are finding that the trans censorship conjecture, that is that the sub planking modes do not cross the horizon, already gives you a slope condition of the same type we have observed in string theory. So regardless of whether we believe the argument has to be correct or not, it's quite amazing that this by itself this principle by itself tells you that the slope should be like this. So what happens if you want eigendimensional operator to your uh, scalar gravity condition? Well, here, I, here we are assuming, so one can, one can ask very different extensions of it. Here I'm just taking the low energy part. I'm assuming that this is the dominant low energy description. One can ask whether there could be regimes where the Einstein gravity doesn't apply or the higher derivative terms and so on. So yes, I'm not describe, describing that. So the statement is that in regions where you have Einstein's theory of gravity coupled to the scalars as the prominent modes, as particular modes, this is the restriction. That's the better way of asking the question. Of course, if you have, if you have a theory which has you know, massive modes, like what you're asking and so on, this still applies because you can set those masses, massive modes to zero. That's the solution. The problem is only for the modes which have to be you can always choose a background, and this is, I can always re relate to that background, regardless of whether it's the background of our universe or not. So I'm saying if you have a Lagrangian, which have massive modes, massive mold, gauge fields, scalars, and all that, I can look at solutions which couple the scale, which turn off, turn off everything else except for the gravity and phi. I mean, I'm a little, a little bit worried that you, for example, add uh, d phi to the fourth. It's going to give you a condition on phi uh, triple dot. Yes, yes. So, <coughs> so here, I'm, here I'm talking. And you have yes, a condition yes, yes. with no problem. Yes, yes. So I'm talking so here. There's a mismatch between. No. So here I'm talking about descriptions which are at low energy being dissipated by graph phi squared plus v of phi. 
If you add corrections to that phi term, or if you add corrections to Einstein's theory, which are big, then this equation won't apply. I'm assuming the usual Einstein equation, so yes. So within that context, we're deriving this. Of course, this is the correct context to apply in string theory where this happens too. So this is perfectly self-consistent description. But it could be that, uh, that this formula is, is only limited to these cases, but this principle is more general. That is, no matter what, you never have to, you should never cross it, but then the equation that you use may not be that equation, for example, which I suspect that's the, that's the case I would look at. Now, um, so I'm glad that you guys have this flexibility of time because I'm running relatively slowly with this. Um, so, uh, so then, yes? What are the rules on to? I'm still trying to get my head around what are the rules about where you get B5 from. Should it be the potential of the fundamental theory of, of nature, or, to, or could it be some effective potential you derive from, from some? <laughs> this is the effective potential, including all the corrections. <laughs> the full, full effective observable potential, not the, not the quote unquote UVB, not the ultraviolet one, the one that they actually measure. And so, this, well, why is the supergravity potential disallowed then? Because that's. Okay, I'll come to that. I'll come to why some cases are disallowed in my last topic in general, fourth one. But that's basically the Swampland program, which I will try to enunciate again more. Supergravity theories, which look perfectly beautiful, mm -hmm. may not exist. That's a sad story, maybe, but that's, I, I'll give evidence for that story. <laughs> that why could it be, how could, so it, how could the reality be so unkind to supergravity? So what can I say about that? If is proved to be finite, then it's orthogonal to your Yes, if it were to be consistent, finite, etc., it would have been contradiction, yes. Okay. So I'll come to some <laughs> examples along those lines that it would be related to my last talk. But the supergravities which have a potential which is finite to infinity, they are not the ones that are coming from string theory, I guess. Yeah, no, he's, he's just saying as an effective supergravity, there's no problem. But I'm just saying those are not consistent supergravity theories when you include, when you want to ask unitarity of that theory and this and this and this and that. That's all. But the ones coming from string theory, for example, do they have the potential of finite to infinity? Yeah, they can, because you know, it's an effective potential of some particular compactification. So no, no, in all the compactification in string theory, the potential does go to zero. That, 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 is, that is true. That's well known. That's, a, that's an easy argument. That, that you can actually argue. That, that's, not an, that's not difficult to argue. So when I make effects by M5, M2 brains, I put a bunch of M2 brains down and I get an effect. So, so for example, in the ADS, ADS 4 times S7, for example, yeah. there's a radius of S7, yeah. and for that, it goes to zero. Now, maybe, for example, the potential literally is this. And you go here. It goes to zero. We are talking about the pot potential Einstein frame of the lower dimensional theory. Maybe that's a confusion here. Yes, it goes to zero when you go to the Einstein frame in, in ADS. Um, that's, I think that's probably the confusion, the, 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 the Einstein frame issue. OK, um, right, so where was it? OK, so, so So then you might say, okay, what about the sitter space? Well, this the sitter space is ruled out then based on this as well. Well, not quite, not quite. The reason is, if you have the sitter space, uh, beta, so for example, suppose you have a situation like this. By the way, one thing I want to say is that the fact that the potential does go to zero already proves that if you have a meta state, if, if you have a sitter space locally, it better be meta stable because there's always a zero somewhere far away. So that's already consistent with the fact that in all the potential scenarios people are proposing <coughs> in string theory, nobody's looking for exactly stable desitter, everybody's possibly looking for metastable at this. So this is already saying if there is a desitter, it better be metastable just by the fact that potential goes to zero. Okay, that's one, one part of the statement. But then could it be that we are in a situation like this where a squared is some kind of lambda, where lambda is that, that, is that height? Well, if that's the case, then you see that the transpagian censorship conjecture is violated because you can stay in that space for a while and A final to A initial at time T goes like E to the HD. And therefore, um, this can be bigger than one over H, which is constant. If you wait long enough, it will always cross it at some point. 
and therefore this will violate and this will say this is not allowed. However, this is this can actually be okay as long as you can decay out. If you can decay out, then this, this computation stops working. So in other words, this is saying the transplanting censorship conjecture does not prove that there is no visitor. It will only imply that the middle stable visitor should be fast have a fast enough decay to decay before it violates this statement. So what kind of bound it gives, from this you can work out, and you find that the time it, it, it should uh, decay by is given by 1 over h times log of 1 over h in time units. So, so that means that if you have, if you have measured dark energy through this equation and you put it here, you get an upper bound on the life of that universe where the dark energy is measured. If you ignore this log factor, it just means that the time scale of the visitor is the visitor scale, basically. That means you it's about to decay. In other words, in any universe that the dark energy is measured, you're about to decay. It cannot, in other words, it's the same time scale. Which is actually might sound worrisome, except be happy because there's a log factor here. And it is very small. So this gives you about two trillion years, for example. So, uh, so we are about 15 or whatever billion years now. So we have a few more big things to go, but not too far, unfortunately. But actually, you might say this is sad. Actually, I think this is the opposite. It's actually telling us that coincidence problem is not a coincidence. In any universe where the dark energy is a good fraction of the energy budget of the universe, you are about to decay. There is no coincidence that we have discovered dark energy agreeing with the age of our universe, because that's the time scale in which we're going to go away anyhow. So therefore, it explains the coincidence problem. It's not going, we are not going to last for gazillions years away from here. So this is an interesting prediction for the, age of, for the lifetime of our universe, if there is a visitor. If there is no visitor, you again find that the lifetime of our universe will go, will go of the order of one age <coughs> in the sense that what's happening, since we have measured the dark energy, you find that you're actually going to be rolling. You're either rolling to positive or to negative values, but at any rate, you can estimate based on the slope how long it takes for you to roll of order one in five units, by which time you get the light power of states coming in, and again you estimate the lifetime of order one over h. To be, so in other words, regardless of whether you're decaying or you have a metal stable besetter, it's predicting that the natural lifetime of the scale of that universe where you don't get a new phase is of the order of the corresponding scale set by the dark energy itself. So that's, that's a, in other words, the coincidence problem is, is explained regardless of whether you are in the sitter situation or in the quintessence type of scenario. Okay, so that is my second topic. And but in quintessence, sorry, in quintessence, you'd actually be going, so if you this, in quintessence, this is the time until which you hit the point of uh, an infinite tower, or? Yes, yes. So this is the time scale in which you're going to hit the tower of light states. Mm -hmm. That's what it is, and that's the right scale. Mm -hmm. It could be a factor of 10, 20, it depends on how, what the yeah, exponent yeah. of that. But the log is not there. The log is not there, but that's related, that's replaced by how far you want to go to get to that, mm -hmm. to that scale. Okay. Um. <coughs> so finally, uh, the third topic is coordinate classes. And this one now. And this is basically uh, the following statement. Suppose you study, uh, first of all, what is cobordism? I'll tell you what is cobordism. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, the basic idea is this. You, you look at, uh, you look at the, some, some dimension B. You look at the space of manifolds in that dimension. Now, you can put some kind of a structure on these manifolds. It could be spin manifolds, orientable manifolds, different that. You have, to put, you have to choose a structure. But you can just not worry about it. This is with some suitable structure, a d-dimensional manifold. And you say two manifolds are equivalent if, if there's an interpolation between them by one higher dimensional manifold 
it takes you from one to the other. So if M1 and M2 are on the boundary of a one higher dimensional manifold in this orientation, you say M1 is equal to M2. So um, there's also an addition principle here. You can take M1, M and N, and you can say that if, if they go to another one here, K, we say M plus N is K if this happens. If M and N are the boundary which leads you to some other manifold K. Anyhow, this has been defined by mathematicians. It gives you a natural abelian group. Nice, nice, nice story. With the usual stories, you know, it's a, a group has inner minus and a plus and so on. Everything works beautifully and it's nice. Okay. Okay, now I come back to string theory. So this is basically a quick, quick description from the definition of what coordism means. What is the coordism of M theory? What is the coordism of string theory? <coughs> if you have coordism classes, which are different, that means if you think about this as some kind of Euclidean time, if you have two different classes which are not connectable by some suitable manifold, interpolating manifold, this means that you cannot go evolve from one theory to the other. They're disconnected in quantum gravity, which what that means is that you can define a charge, which measures them. The charge is precisely related to the fact that this Abelian group exists. So if you are a non q element of Abelian group, you can never evolve to the trivial one. That's the definition of the coordinates class. So therefore, there is a symmetry. Okay? So gravity theory with a symmetry. But one of the principles of quantum gravity says you cannot have global symmetries <coughs> in quantum gravity. Well, you might say, well, this could be gauge symmetry, but this cannot be gauge symmetry if ends are compact. You cannot have global charges on a compact gate charges on a compact space. And therefore, this cannot exist in a quantum theory of gravity. And therefore, cobordism classes are trivial. There is no non-trivial cobordism class. Everything should be possible to evolve to everything else. That's a prediction of just lack of existence of global symmetries in the quantum theory of gravity. OK. So this is a kind of a trivial kind of sounding statement. Great. You have a zero, big fat zero. What's that good for? Well, let me try to remind you that big fat zeros are sometimes good, good parts of uh, things. Suppose we are talking about gauge theories. And suppose we are talking about particles that we have in, for example, standard model. Suppose we had not discovered all the, all the particles in standard models, and we computed gauge anomalies, and we found it wasn't zero. We would say, ha, huh, there is another particle around there at least to contribute to the gauge anomalies to make it zero. So having zeros is very predictive, right? So not something, if you take degrees of freedom into account and this doesn't add up to zero, you're predicting a new state. This is exactly what would happen in the coordinate classes. Namely, suppose you start with a string theory or M theory or something with a particular structure that you think is good. A manifold with spin structure, with non-orientable, whatnot, that is the right, you think is the right category. And suppose you measure the coordinate classes to be non-trivial. Then you predict there must be something you're missing in that structure because it should have been trivial. For example, you might discover that you should allow singularity for this manner <coughs> of some suitable type, which allows you to kill that coordinate class. So therefore, you learn something about the theory. So it's a non-trivial prediction. So this is abstract. So let me give you concrete examples of what you as an example. First of all, let me make it more dramatic in actually telling you a way to think about this. Suppose you talk about a manifold with spin structure. Well, super strings have the spinners, so it's natural to look at spin structures. It turns out the coordinates class in four dimensions for spin manifold is not zero, and it's given by z. This is generated by a four manifold, and you might be happy to hear that's a familiar one, it's k3 generates the coordinates class of spin manifolds in 4D. For example, if you talk about type 2B string theory, spin manifold, you could ask, what does this global symmetry I was telling you about? What is that corresponding to? Easy. Take P1, 
the first part of the eigen class, which is R with R, has a form, if you wish. And you can put the proportional factor such that if you integrate this over K3, let's say it's 1. You can define a current, higher form current, <coughs> not the one form current, but higher form current, which is the star of T1. And trivially, this star of J is 0. It's conserved. Okay? So I just gave you a conserved charge. A conserved global charge. How do I know it's global? Well, there's no gauge field in type to be distinguished couples to this. There's no A which A, A mu J mu term corresponding to this. There is no gauge field that gives you this. So this is not a gate charge, it's a global charge. So I just constructed for you a gate symmetry, a global symmetry in type 2B. And you should be screaming because there should not be any global symmetries in the quantum theory of gravity. What happens to this global symmetry? Let me explain why it has to be disappearing. Consider four-dimensional background in type 2B. For example, think about compactification of type 2B on T6, for example. Or, sorry, T5. So you have a four-dimensional space. And I'm not drawing the time. So this is that nice space. But take one, point, one, one little point in R4 and dig a three-dimensional sphere ball near it and attach to it a copy of K3, which is also removing. You remove a point on K3 which is surrounded by a three sphere, and identify the three sphere to the rest of this R4. So this is what's called the connected sum. You're, so, you're connecting the three manifold K3 to R4. Okay, fine. And then put a black hole here. So from the viewpoint of the four dimensional perspective, it looks, think about K3 as a small, make a tiny K3. You think about this like a point defect somewhere in space where the K3 is attached, and this big fat black hole here. And then you throw the K3 inside the black hole and shred it apart. So the black hole is, binds the K3 apart to nothing. Black hole evaporates. You lose that K3 charge. So somehow that charge would have been not there in the theory anyhow. In other words, you can think about this process I just told you as a way to construct triviality of that covordism class. The black hole evaporation process will kill that class. So this should somehow not be a symmetry, and therefore this should be going away. OK. So let me give you other examples that you're now more, perhaps it's more familiar. Suppose you have, take a Ramon Ramon fields in type 2 strings, A, type 2 B, etc. So there's some P, P plus 1 form or whatever field strings, and they are force closed. Right? <coughs> so we can define again the usual thing. You can define a conserved current, J star of F, and B star J is 0. So out of F, we created a conserved current, a global symmetry. If you have F, the, the fluxes of F give you non-trivial cobordism classes, again. So capping the first term class, or depending on what the dimension of the form, the P plus 1 integral. If that's non-zero, the flux of this guy give you non-trivial cobordism classes. And therefore, you again have trouble. This concert, you get conserved charges. This conserved charge cannot appear in string theory. So what is the resolution? The resolution is that there are configurations for which this is not zero, and there's some kind of monopole, that's a function, which, which puts a solution, which gives you a source for the F. Therefore, this tells you the triviality of covariance, not the triviality of covariance classes, predicts that the spectrum should be complete. That is, you should be able to violate this the F equals zero. So that's, of course, we know. That's, a com that's one of the conjectures of Swamp, and that the spectrum is complete, consistent with the black hole entropy and all that story. So therefore, you see again an example where we actually kind of know this, and this is related to the completeness of the spectrum in the context of string theory. Okay, now I give you some more examples. Let's talk about n theory. Let me forget about g flux for now. Suppose we set, we consider backgrounds in n theory for which g flux is turned off. In this context, what do we have? Well, we have n theory allows uh, we have to have spinners. 
but it doesn't have to be an orientable manifold because M theory does have parity as a symmetry and you can consider configuration which is introduced as Z2, so you have non-orientable manifold. So you study what's called the pink cobordism classes and depending on how the minus one to the F squared is plus or minus, this is M theory is what's called the pink plus. So you can call, consider the omega, the cobordism classes of pink plus and study it in various dimensions. And so in dimension 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, for example, it's studied already, it's known. And I'll just tell you what the dimensions are. Let me just actually get it correct. Okay, you have some, some Z2s and so on. But I told you it should be 0. These are not 0. What's going on? Well. This is telling you that the fact that it's not zero, that means there's some missing what, what is the cat category of objects we study. This theory, this fact that, for example, dimension zero Z2, means that the point cannot be a boundary of a manifold. But actually, it can be in the context of string theory. Hojava Witten wall is exactly that. Therefore, it's a singular manifold from the viewpoint of string, from math mathematicians may not have liked it to study it, but we know it's allowed in string theory. Therefore, we should say the category we started with is not just a, a non orthogonal manifold. It should allow the singularity of the type R mod Z2. And this kills this class. What is this class? Let me talk about dimension 4. Z16. Well, the class generated here is RP4. Again, it's killed. What is it killed by? R5 mod Z2. Again, is, a, is an oriented form which is allowed in M theory. And that kills the RP4 class. The boundary of this S5 mod C2 is RP4, and that, that trivializes it. Again, it's a singular space, but string theory allows it. Good, so this singularity kills it. This is done. Similarly, this Z32 is R9 mod Z2 kills it. This Z2 here is Cotarianic projective space, generated by the Cotarian projective space. But if you construct it, it's actually anomalous. Namely, you find the charge is not zero because you need to turn on a G flux. So without the G flux is anomalous, the tadpole cancellations don't happen. So this is not an allowed background. Because I've turned off G equal to zero. You're left with these two cases. This one is generated by fine bottle. To compactify M theory on fine bottle is perfectly nice and super symmetric. And this other one is fine bottle time to circle. So these two classes have to be killed by something higher dimension. So in other words, there must be a three-dimensional geometry whose boundary is a fine bottle, which is allowed in M theory, but not allowed for smooth manifolds. What is it? We don't know. In fact, it's easy to prove that whatever is that three manifold breaks supersymmetry completely. So there is no compactification which preserves supersymmetry unlike the other ones which we do know about. So all the other cases that could have been created without, with preserving super, some amount of supersymmetry, we know them. But this one we don't. But now we are predicting that there must be non-supersymmetric configurations, a three-dimensional compactification on M theory with boundary Klein bottle, which breaks all supersymmetries, should exist. That's a prediction that is teaching us something about non-supersymmetric aspects of M theory, which is hard to argue otherwise. So, the th so this is actually is very much similar in spirit to what people have been doing in lower dimensional quantum field theory, in three and four dimensions in particular, where the power of anomalies and higher form symmetries have told us something about the dynamics, strong coupling dynamics of these non-supersymmetric non theories. Here, the idea that the convergence class is trivial is teaching us something about the non-trivial dynamics of gravity in the context of non-supersymmetric theories. So let me actually uh, finish this song and this, the uh, discussion by one more example, one more general comment. All of what I'm saying here can be described. Yes, I mean, you, you need a string structure in order to have string two, which puts constraints on the P1 class. How does that play into um, what you're saying? Well, the string structure exists for hetero one. I was talking about type 2B here. The type 2B is perfectly fine with the spin manifold. But there is a version of that with the heterotic stream, which is string structure. In fact, what's called more, more precisely TMS structure, for example. Right. 
which you can you can describe and so forth. And there will be different condition. Again, if non, there are some non-zero elements. And that's again because you're missing some of the ingredients. And so in other words, the fact that it's not zero is exactly a good story that you learn that there are things that are missing. And you can argue some of them have to be described by non-supersymmetric objects, which is we don't have a good understanding of them in string theory. Now, um, the good thing about this is that all of what I just told you about the coordinates and classes and all that can be said without appealing to a string theory. Because you could say, wait a second, I cannot be using n theory or type theory or type theory because that's not an invariant way of asking it. You should be talking about without referring it to because dualities, mix them up. So what do I mean by this structure or that structure? The good thing is that we can say this in the low dimensional perspective. From perspective of our observables in 3 plus 1. The statement is that any quantum theory of gravity should admit the, a boundary. That's it. What that means is that, for example, if you have a string theory that you have a manifold and you combine to it, this should be trivial means that you should be able to tap it off by one higher dimensional object. And you should think about this as like a compactification of that string theory, would be string theory here. That means tapping off means that the work should end. So there should be a boundary. So the statement is that any quantum theory of gravity should admit boundaries. That's all. For example, does that mean the word should end? Like a D6 brain, for example, you know, can could be. be a brain, which doesn't need to end. I mean, the space still exists around it. I mean, yes, here I'm saying that from perspective of lower dimensional ones, could be a smooth geometry. Oh, I'm just saying that whatever thing you have, <coughs> that as from some viewpoint of the lower dimensional geometry, it should look like okay. end of the universe. But the okay, okay, monopole, for example, in M theory, yeah, it's like this. The end, yeah. But the D6 brain is not the end of the universe. I mean, okay, from uh, from the from in, in, in 4D, if you think about you know, compactifying on T on, on T6 down down to four dimensions, the D6 brain on T6 is just a singularity. It's not. No, no, not that would not be the end of the universe. Here I'm talking about literally the co-dimension one in the space time. Co-dimension one, point one in space time. Oh. Yeah, yeah, bound, literally boundary, domain, the do boundary of the space time. So in other words, in our universe, mm -hmm. you should be able to create a bubble of nothing. In our universe, in current universe, there should be geometries where there's nothing there. So we're making such a prediction. In fact, better yet, you can put anything there. Because what I'm saying is that anything have, could have a bubble of nothing, and so you can connect anyone to anyone on the other. So if you are here, and if you have another manifold, there must be a way to connect this manifold to another manifold. This is very much in the spirit that the string theory seems to, the duality seems to connect different solutions. But this is a much stronger statement. You do not have to be compactified, collab, yao, and this and that. At finite distance, you should be able to go from any vacuum to any other vacuum. So for example, if you are enamored with a collab, yao compactification, let's say on Z manifold, in our universe with no supersymmetry whatsoever, you should be able to create, in principle, a bubble of this compactification of Z manifold. There should be no, no topological obstruction to doing this with finite energy. Of course, it could be huge energy. It could be that's behind the horizon of it. would be black hole, all, all that stuff. But the statement is that this should be possible. So, so this is the discussion for the coordinates. I'm, I'm sorry that I've run, run late. So let me just, the last topic, which is what I'm going to cover for the, uh, on Monday uh, in IHES in the morning, I'll just tell you what the statement is. The statement is that with theories with 16 supercharges, there's an upper bound in the number of massless modes. Very surprising from supergravity. Let me tell you why it's surprising. If you take, for example, n equal to four in n equal to four supersymmetric theories in four dimensions, these theories are finite. Okay? Nothing could be more beautiful in four D quantum field theories than n equals to four supersymmetric gang mills. Beautiful finite theory. For any gauge group. We have constructed a number of these examples from string <coughs> theory, heterotic strings, type 2 strings, MK, or some. We have a lot of examples. The claim is that any theory with a equals to 4 and b equals to 4 has to have the rank of the group is less than equal to 22. This is surprising, right? Nick? Because it is true, it's telling you that supergravity is missing the whole point. The n equals to 4 super, super gang is a finite theory. How could you not be able to cover it for supergravity for general group? The claim is you cannot. Sorry, where is the gravity here? I mean, this is. No, I'm saying take, take this and couple it to n equals to four supergravity. The claim is you cannot do it in a consistent way, even though the beginning point is perfectly good for arbitrary g. The only ones that are counterexamples are the rank of g's less than or equal to 22. So I will give an argument for this uh, on Monday. Do we know any examples, by the way? Sorry? Do you know any examples where we can couple it to supergravity? Yes, yes, yes. So, the, so hey, the on T6. <coughs> <coughs> T6. 
is exactly 22. Mm -hmm. But there are ones with less than 22 also. For example, you can take CHL strings, or you can take uh, climb bottle. They give you different ones with different, different number of groups. The ranks are not always 22. You have 22 or less, but never higher than 22. I claim there's an upper bound by supergravity arguments, not necessarily string theory. So therefore, this is telling you that don't think just because your corner field theory is beautiful, it's good theory to couple to go with gravity. This is the point of the swamp line. The point is that you cannot be sure what is the good criteria. Here I will, I will explain what criteria from gravity perspective would give this condition, but I will not say it now, I will say it on Monday. Thank you. Yes. It's a bit higher, I think. Yes. So, so the, the work we don't have a, we don't we don't phrase it like this. We don't have a, something as sharp as the statement. So what we did with eight supercharges, the first case where this arises is in six dimension, with one comma zero. Now, one comma zero is a chiral theory, and uh, the anomalies are very non-trivial to satisfy. So, so uh, uh, Taylor and collaborators have classified what kind of anomaly cancellations, what anomaly cancellation conditions in a supersymmetric gravity coupled to matter would imply with these theories. So they have found an infinite set. A finite number of them has been realized in the F-theory compactification on elliptic three folds, but there are infinitely many more that has not been realized. They're perfectly fine, anomaly canceling non-trivially, so therefore they have all the right to exist, okay? We prove with a similar kind of reasoning as, as we did here, and that, that paper actually appeared before this one, that among those that they cannot appear, at least a, an infinite subset of them can also be ruled out for the same reasoning. So there, there are reasonings that get rid of them even though it looks perfectly fine. Anomaly free, it looks perfectly nice. Supergravity is nice, doesn't exist. What failed in those cases, as I would explain in my talk on Monday, is the following. You can prove that, you can argue that these theories, which needs to have strings because the spectrum of gravity is complete, you study what lives on that string. Anomaly inflows tell you something about the central charges that that string sees. But then the unitarity of the gauge theory, the unitarity of the 2D CFT on that string puts a bound on the rank of the gauge group com compared to the anomaly inflow. And that rules out by unitarity on that defect, that theory. So if you assume unitarity of the theory, and if you use the unitarity on the defects, it will rule out the things we didn't see in string theory. So this is actually quite nice because it reinforces the, the, the string lamppost principle. That is, people kind of say sometimes like, yeah, you see, in string theory, you can only have a few of these examples, which are very special. You can study them, and you're trying to get grandiose principles of gravity based on these few examples, but you're only looking at the string lamppost. The other ones you cannot even study. So how can you come up with a general prediction based on these other examples? It's a valid criticism. So it could be that we are not potentially looking far enough because we just don't know how to do it. For example, these 60 examples and so on would have said that you have infinitely many possibilities. Just like in 4D, you would have other infinitely many Gs. The fact that now we're actually saying, no, 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 the ones that you're getting in street are the only consistent ones actually changes that story potentially. And that's exactly the point. In other words, the lessons that we draw from the string landscape is useful in finding general principles and then arguing without using string theory why they work. So that's, that's, the, that's the key here. And so we're beginning to get uh, further evidence that the string lamppost principle works, that string theory is, is the only game in town. Is this continuous condition stronger than positive conditions? In 60, you mean? Yes. So in 60, it seems like it's the same. That's what we want to show. We haven't been able to prove it yet because there are still some examples that Taylor et al. have, which, is, uh, which doesn't, cannot be satisfied using the uh, geometry, Kavia geometry, but we expect them not to exist, and we haven't been able to rule them out. So we haven't proven that, but that's what I expect will happen. I have a question about this, this co-dimension and at this end of the universe. Uh, argument from Hubert. So, so can you repeat, you know, how, how, how do you get the, conc the, the conclusion that uh, this, this, uh, this manifold must, this, this, this boundary defect must exist? No, no, I'm just saying that the fact that if you have a string compactly and some man will use some construction, if you say that there is a, 
if this is a trivial class, it means that you have to be able to bound it by a higher dimensional man, one higher dimensional manifold. Mm -hmm. View that higher dimensional manifold as part of your space. That means that you go in that direction to stop. That's all. That's just it's more or less the tautology of the state. Mm -hmm. No questions? Okay, that's it.